A vote recount got underway in Wisconsin Thursday, part of a push initiated by Green Party candidate Jill Stein that includes Michigan and Pennsylvania as well. Amid claims of voting irregularities in these battleground states, President-elect Donald Trump took to Twitter to blast the recount effort as a scam while alleging serious voter fraud in Virginia, New Hampshire, and California. Tweeting last Sunday, quote, in addition to winning the Electoral College in a landslide, I won the popular vote if you deduct the millions of people who voted illegally. Hans von Spakovsky is a former member of the Federal Election Commission and a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He's also co-author of the book, Who's Counting? How Fraudsters and Bureaucrats Put Your Vote at Risk. So welcome to the program. Uh, let's start with the recount. Uh, uh, is there any evidence uh, of enough voter fraud in these states to overturn the election outcome? Well, remember, Jill Stein's not claiming voter fraud. She's claiming hacking of the voting machines. Uh, she has absolutely no evidence of any kind to do that. And in fact, the way the the, those machines work, they, they are not tied into a central computer system. They are not networked. Uh, that is, the machines, for example, right. that scan ballots. So th the ability of hackers to get into it is just about nil. Th this is a complete and total waste of time by, by Jill Stein. Well, just to, just to take her, uh, the, 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 the suggestion of uh, hacking seriously for a second, what would a hacker have to do in our decentralized electoral system to be able to influence the outcome of the result? Would they have to have, how, how would they have uh, penetrated so many different sites? Well, well, they couldn't. For example, uh, most electronic voting machines, again, they're not networked. So you'd have to get physical access to each electronic voting machine. Similarly, in, uh, in precincts that use paper ballots, the kind that are, that are optically scanned by a computer, you'd have to get somehow physical access, access to the computer scanner. Uh, th that is almost impossible to do, very, very difficult. So the chances of, uh, of this uh, uh, being hacked like I said, it's just about nil. Okay, so just in a recount, uh, normal recount, uh, have you ever seen a recount that overturned more than 10,000 votes in any kind of election? <laughs> no, no, look, in the last two decades, there have been a little more than two dozen statewide recounts. Only in three of those uh, was the race overturned. One of those was the Coleman-Franken race in 2008 in Minnesota. In every single case, the margin of victory was less than 1,000 votes. You simply are not going to get a bigger movement than that, even in a statewide recount. All right, let's talk about Donald Trump's claims of, uh, of sure. fraud in the election. Uh, uh, what do you make of uh, his claim that there were, there were up to millions of uh, fraudulent voters? Well, I, I would say he's more right than his critics. We d actually don't know the answer to that. And the, the problem is, is that our whole voter registration process is pretty much based on an honor system. I, I, I'll, I will tell you, we know for certain that non-citizens are illegally registering and voting. There have been cases all across the country of people being prosecuted for that, right. uh, but there's no systematic way of verifying citizenship. A number of surveys have looked at this, uh, and non-citizens themselves admit that they are registered to vote. I, it could be anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of non-citizens being registered. Okay, well, if, well, but let, let me just take the detail. That's because uh, if you're if you're an illegal uh, immigrant here, you can go out and get a, a fake ID, fake social security card, fake driver's license, and then walk in and register to vote, even with those fake documents. Nobody's going to check those. They'll do it as you say. It's the honor system. So that's the basis for the ability of people right. to register, even if they're not citizens. Correct. Yes, but also non-citizens who are here legally. Many of them go and get driver's licenses, and they are asked where they want to register to vote, and they're allowed to register to vote. Uh, a case in Virginia just before the election, uh, more than 1,000 non-citizens were found registered in just eight counties in the state, all of them here legally, but illegally registered, and many of them had voted in prior elections. Okay, but there's a question of magnitude here. Just how, right. do, do we have any sense of what that magnitude is? I mean, you're, you mentioned anecdotes, and anecdotes are, 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 are worth mentioning, but uh, statistically, we really don't know how, my, how many people might be fraudulent voters, do we? No, th there we have to again look at the surveys. Based on the surveys, it could be anywhere from 2% to over 6% of non-citizens voting in elections, which could be anywhere from a couple of hundred thousand to over a million. What should states do to, to, limit, uh, to, to limit this kind of uh, voter fraud? 
Uh, every state should have a law like Kansas that says uh, when you register to vote, you have to provide proof of citizenship. And frankly, the Trump administration needs to start a new project whereby the Department of Homeland Security starts checking state voter registration lists to verify citizenship of people who are registered to vote. So, but this is typically done on a state basis. This is not something that you would do nationally in terms of voter uh, ID laws. No, that's right. But states have had problems with the Obama administration because the Obama administration has tried to stop all verification of citizenship on voter registration lists. Okay, uh, Hans von Spakovsky, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Washington has tried to put us in boxes. They separate us by race, by age, by income, by geography, by place of birth. We spend too much time focusing on what divides us. Now is the time to embrace the one thing that truly unites us. You know what that is? America. America. It's America. All right, that was President-elect Donald Trump at last night's thank you rally in Cincinnati, Ohio, where we were. Joining us now with Reaction, nationally syndicated radio talk show host with the Salem Radio Network, Larry Elder is with us, Fox News contributor Mercedes Schlapp, and who, according to reports, is being pushed as a possible RNC chair by members of the Trump team. That's Mercedes. Yeah. Also joining us is Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi, and she met with President-elect Trump earlier today at Trump Tower. Um, how did the meeting go? Good? Oh, it went great. Yeah. No, I've, I've, of course, I talk to him frequently, and I've met with him several times, and I'm on the transition team. He is working so hard, Sean, and he oh. is already um, being you know, an amazing He works Saturdays, life. Sundays. He invites Non-stop. a lot of people in, meeting a lot of people, which I think is great. I love the idea when people do nice things for you. Maybe I'm old school. You say thank you. Yes. And then he went to Ohio. He said thank you, and he said Everything I said, I meant, and I'm going to follow through on. And he's doing it. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. doing it. And he's working so hard already. And it's just amazing to really see him in there as president elect and how much he cares and how sincere he is and the brilliant choices he's making um, to fill his cabinet and all the spots around him. And I'm, I'm just, I'm proud to be his friend. Uh, Mercedes, why would you ever want to follow <laughs> Reince Priebus when Republicans have more state yeah. houses, more governorships? <laughs> Now they have the White House, the House, and Senate. There's only probably one way to go from here, and that's down. Why would you want that job? <laughs> well, it, no, not going down at all with Donald Trump. We're going up. Right. Are you kidding me? Well, you, so, you won't be happy until we have every state house, every, every that's government. That's right. We've we got to keep moving forward and, and building the Republican Party. But, you know, it's an honor to even be considered. Obviously, that's a decision for the president-elect and the committee members vote. On the next RNC chairman, uh, I have to say, Reince Priebus and his team has, have done such an outstanding job. Talk about someone who's been fair and tough, and have had a, has had one of the toughest jobs during the primary season. And the fact that he's been able to build out such a solid ground game uh, for the party, I think, has been impressive. So I think there's that's a lot the of great talent out there. So we'll see what happens. The, the ground sorry. game that they had built. He told me four years ago when Romney lost, that was their biggest weakness. They were going to fix it. Larry, as as you watch, as a more libertarian conservative what president-elect Trump is doing Are you happy so far with what he's saying and what he's planning to do I really am. Uh, he's, he's connecting with the American people. Uh, I said this uh, many times on your show, Sean. It is still the economy stupid. People are economically anxious. And this deal with Carrier uh, is huge. He saved a thousand jobs. He's delivered already on one of his campaign promises uh, to protect American jobs, uh, to put America first. I couldn't be happier. He wants to cut taxes. He wants to uh, rein in some of these asinine regulations that have killed jobs. Uh, and he wants to do something about securing the borders that has put downward pressure uh, on people working in the inner city who have low skills, all of which will give us a thriving economy far better than what we've had for the last eight years. I'm ecstatic. You know, and that's the funny thing. You're watching how the left is reacting to this, and even the jobs at Carrier. Mm -hmm. you, you right. know, the, all he said was it's going to be a better business environment, better climate for corporations, corporate tax 15 percent, repatriated money, eliminating regulations. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're going to spend $16 million on that plant, 1,100 more people have jobs. 
and the left is complaining. Mm -hmm. The women of The View went insane. Uh, uh, how in the world could they complain? These, these families are now going to have, and I think I heard you say this, a great holiday, a Christmas. They're going to have jobs. They're going to be able to keep their homes. He's doing exactly what he said he was going to do. He's helping people. Yeah. When you meet with him, what is he, what is he asking you? What, is he, what do you well, talk about? You know, I, I, I don't think anyone should talk out of school when you're on the transition and, and, right. and, and, and you're in the room with him, but, but he's, he's always charismatic, he's funny, he's so down to earth, and um, as well as uh, Ryan's, I can't say enough good things about Ryan's and, and Steve Bannon and, and the whole team, and they, yeah. they're working so hard. You know, Mercedes, you took a lot, of, a lot from the Never Trumper people. You, even, you and your husband, Matt, you guys were kind of... Well, isolated there in Washington a little bit for a while, right. right? Right. Well, I think we have the scars to prove it. But, uh, you know, I, what I'm really excited about is the fact that when you do see a Donald Trump out back in, in, the, in what I would say the rallies, it gives him an opportunity to connect with the people. And it really gives him such energy. And I have to say, you know, looking at the team that he's putting around him, the cabinet picks, conservative picks that he's, uh, folks that he's chosen, I think Sean is sending a very strong message of how he's going to lead, even yeah. taking the case of carrier company where uh, it's showing his type of leadership, which is, guess what? You he's know, not going to waste time. He's going to get results done. And, and I think that that is promising compared to when oh, President Obama said, we'll never get those jobs back from carrier. This is not a guy who's going to give up. And I think that that is very, such a refreshing attitude you know, uh, for the, the American people. Larry, one thing you have often said and I've said is that, okay, 90% of the black vote historically goes to the, the Democrats. If Trump is able to target some inner cities with some of this economic growth, the building of factories, creation right. of jobs, coupled with the education money going back to states and local municipalities, where I think inner cities have been disproportionately impacted in a negative way, um, could that shift the demographics come 2020? I think it's already happening. And don't forget vouchers. This is a man who wants to give inner city parents a choice. And the polls overwhelmingly show black and brown parents living in the inner city do not want to be told where to send their kid to an underperforming government school. He wants to give them vouchers so that the money follows the child rather than the other way around. That alone is going to improve uh, the black vote. And already he's done way better with the black vote than uh, John McCain did, uh, than Mitt Romney did four All years right. ago. He got a higher percentage of the black vote. He got a higher percentage of the Hispanic vote than Mitt Romney did, despite his alleged hostility towards Mexicans. All right, guys, good to see you all, and appreciate you being with us. Here we got to bring Geraldo Rivera in this morning. Got <laughs> squash. Good morning. I got to ask you this. No, we're not talking about enough squash soup with you, but uh, we will be with her dad in a little bit. Is there hypocrisy here? I mean, look, when President Obama normalizes relations with a communist country like Cuba, right? Gets on the phone, try, and with the first international flight flying there last week, and then the president, president-elect, is now being criticized for taking a call from a democracy. Democracy, the president of a democratically elected government in Taiwan. Yeah, but I mean, but well, I don't. Where was the outrage on the other side? Taiwan, which uh, was the sole representative of China for decades in American policy, the island of Formosa off the Chinese coast, where the nationalists fled uh, when the communists took over. Uh, mm -hmm. Pete knows the military history very well. Uh, at, at some point, Nixon went to China, big China, said, "You are the sole representative of the Chinese people." Uh, Taiwan then became kind of a, a political outlier, and our policy was to deal with China, the Republic of China. To take the call from the president of Taiwan, to take the call from the renegade island, so to speak, is a major uh, diss for the people in the Republic of China with all their, you know, hundreds of millions of people. So, uh, you know, it may be, I was just thinking about it, it is so outrageous uh, an act in terms of di diplomacy, it might be brilliant. Mm -hmm. It might be a way to jumpstart a new phase Bolton. of U.S.-Chinese relations. I don't know if you caught Ambassador Bolton on our show earlier this morning, who agrees with you. He thinks, he thinks it's time for a shakeup. And at the end of the day, we send a, over a hundred billion dollars of weaponry to Taiwan. So it's sort of like doing this little fake dance for the last. But here's years. the thing: that you, you read the headlines last night, and you, if you were on Twitter at all, 
it felt as if we were heading into World War III. Uh, just some of these headlines there, New York Times, how Trump's call to world leaders are upsetting decades of diplomacy. It goes on and on. But you think about what actually happened, Geraldo. This was just basically a call congratulating him, to which he responded, to thank you. Uh, you're wondering why there was so much outrage in that moment, not to mention he's not even sworn in yet. Well, i am be curious, Abby, to see what your dad, the former ambassador, yeah. says about it. Uh, to me, this is why you need the pros around. You need someone to say, you know, if you do that. Don't you think the pros would have been around? I mean, he wouldn't have just decided to accept the call. Someone probably counseled them, hey, this is something. I don't know. <laughs> I hope. I hope, but I don't know. But knowing him, you know, I've known him for four decades. I, I love the guy. And, and, and particularly these, uh, you know, the last six weeks of uh, Celebrity Apprentice, I was with him every day. He's the kind of guy who would just say, ah, screw it. I'm going to talk to him. I don't care. Ah, go, uh, you know, go uh, do some, shuffle some papers in your bureaucratic <laughs> cubicle. I'm going to take the and call And they come from out of their Taiwan. office and it's trending on Twitter. They come <laughs> yeah. back to President Taiwan. I, I think it's a, it's a very big deal. Uh, I, I'd be interested to see what President Obama or uh, the, 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 the White House has to say about it. Uh, but, you know, uh, what Bolton said might be true, yeah. uh, uh, Clayton. It may be that it's time, the, in the same way it took a, 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 a right conservative President Nixon and Henry Kissinger to go and open China, right. uh, the, which was, uh, you know, uh, playing against caste. No one thought it could happen. Against type. No one thought yep. it could happen. A liberal or, never or, could have done it, and he, the conservative did it. Maybe now this, uh, this flamboyant new mm. entity we have in the, coming into the White House is exactly the one that's shaking it Or up. Reagan with the Soviet Union, the START treaties and all of that. I mean, say, it takes someone who you know is an anti-communist to do that. Yeah, same, yeah. same type of principle. I, I think that if, if it's handled with any kind of uh, finesse, today it'll be a one day service so it's a shake up although we did have a lot of fun fighting hillary didn't we the people back there the extremely dishonest press how about when a major anchor who hosted a debate started crying President-elect Donald Trump showing that he still isn't afraid to call out the dishonest media but some journalists just want to cut it out there were lots of, um, you know, divisive comments, especially and unfortunately about the press, which is I wish he would just stop doing. And not only because we are members of the press, but because as leader of the free world, you do set an example for free press uh, in, in countries around the world. Here to react to that and other commentary is Deputy Opinion Editor of The Washington Times, Kelly Riddell. Thanks for joining us, Kelly. So he's, is he assaulting the press or is he just speaking truth about the bias of the press? Well, you know, you had uh, Chris Eliza at the Washington Post basically tweet, you know, uh, here you have a president booing the press and shouldn't we value basically the freedom of the press? And, you know, I value the First Amendment rights, uh, the freedom and a fair uh, freedom and a, the freedom of the press. But I also think that's important that you're able to freely boo the press because they really are unfair in their coverage of Donald Trump. At that rally, Ben White of CNBC tweeted out, I think it's ridiculous that Donald Trump keeps holding these rallies. And then in a subsequent tweet says, why is Donald Trump, it's odd that Donald Trump is still campaigning. And uh, he failed to mention that President Barack Obama did the exact same thing in 2008. And this is where this double standard mm -hmm. lies. Like, you have the rhetoric of Donald Trump, but then you have the record of Barack Obama. And Barack Obama used the Espionage Act more than any of his previous presidents combined to prosecute reporters and uh, whistleblowers within the government um, and to basically silence them and scare them. Everyone remembers James Rosen and what he right, went sure. through, yeah. um, as well as the AP getting all of their uh, call, all the reporters' call logs uh, subpoenaed by the DOJ. Now, that is real. Yeah. That is, yeah. and, and that is a record and not just rhetoric. Well, what is the future of the press? I mean, obviously, you guys live and die by ad revenue and, and viewership and readership. What's going to happen to those sites, those websites, those, uh, those channels that were dishonest, according uh -huh. to Mr. Trump? Well, I don't think anything's going to happen to them because they've doubled down on their narrative. I think there was a few weeks after he won where they wanted to be more reflective, and you saw some New York Times reporters actually going into the heartland of America and interviewing Trump supporters to try to try to understand where they're coming from. But now they've doubled down on this. Uh, we don't want to normalize Donald Trump. We've got to make sure that we're that we're going after him aggressively. Hmm. So it really is. I think we're back to where we began during the campaign, and Donald Trump's going to have a hard four years with the press. 
No, that's right. I mean, there's a big difference, Kelly, as you point out, between a free press and a fair press. Fair press. So we appreciate your fair commentary this morning. Thanks for joining <laughs> Thank us, Kelly. We will continue our conversation about the president elect. Donald Trump begins his thank you tour in the Midwest this week. He's using it as a form to take aim at his enemies and also talk about his campaign promises. Is this a sign of things to come in the Trump administration? So let's bring in our political panel for a fair and balanced debate and also some insight. Sean Noble is a GOP strategist and president of American Encore, and Ben Wickler is the Washington director of MoveOn.org. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Sean, I want to start with you. Thank you, Tour. We saw it kicked off. Do you think it's effective? Do you like it? He's, is this his populist style, although it's unprecedented? This is what we saw during the campaign. Well, this is very much like what Donald Trump is about. I mean, he wants to have the ear of the people. And so I think this is actually a good move for him because it gives him the ability to go out, tell the people that he's going to keep the promises that he made and show that he's listening to them. Now, one thing that we do know about Donald Trump is that he really does thrive from these types of rallies. I remember when he came to Arizona late in the campaign, many people were saying, why in the world is he going to Arizona? Is Arizona at risk? I said, Arizona is the place where he comes to get the recharge. I think he, the people loved him here, and this is, this is how he feeds the, the ability to continue to go forward. I mean, I think he really gets charged up when he's in front of crowds, and it gives them the, the energy to continue to go forward. All right, Ben, I'm going to assume that, that this isn't something that, that you would do as an advisor, and perhaps you, you may not think it's best for him. Uh, but I do want to ask you, now that he is the president for all, does he need to change the style of these type of rallies because he's not necessarily catering to his base anymore? Well, I think these rallies are great for Donald Trump, and I think they're bad for America. Frankly, I wish that instead of you know, speaking to tens of thousands of his biggest fans, he'd been reading his intelligence briefings. He's only had two intelligence briefings since becoming president-elect. The problem is, you know, the old idea was bread and circuses if you wanted to distract the public. And it seems like right now he's going for an all-circus, no-bread approach. The GOP well, has just blocked overtime pay extensions. He's I, talking about canceling I mean, people's health insurance. We need a president who's focused on actually delivering for the public as okay. opposed to just reaping. Well, first of all, he, he, well, he's, that's he's not he a... Went to, that's why he went to Indiana. He went to Indiana to deliver on a promise of keeping jobs in the United States. I mean, say what you will about whether, you know, what the circumstances were. He said we were going to keep jobs in the U.S. He did it with Carrier. He yeah, went to know, talk about it. Carrier, the, the plant staying here, that same day that he was in Indiana was the day that 250,000 Indianans were supposed to get overtime pay. But that was been blocked by a GOP lawsuit, and the Trump administration is showing no that signs that they're actually going to contest that fight. That, well, that's a whole other story. The Trump administration isn't in office yet. I mean, okay, so we can we can talk about that that overtime. That is a whole different topic that President Obama proposed. But I do want to go back to Carrier because that was a big announcement this week, and I want to start with you, Ben, because this is something that you say that perhaps you're critical of. But the fact of the matter is, is that. We haven't seen a terrible amount of Democrats say that they are critical of this because he's keeping a thousand jobs in the United States. No, I love keeping jobs in the United States. I think jobs are great. I think the question is where you put your focus. Is it on untilting the playing field so that workers have a decent shot and the jobs stay here? Or is it running across the playing field and you know, swinging your bat at, at whoever you might see there? And the challenge is that, that uh, President Trump is not going to be able to go factory by factory. And even if he does, that's not the way that you set up an economy. You set up an economy by making rules that people follow that actually work for regular workers. And right. for every one carrier plant that he makes a big show out of, there are a whole lot of other jobs that are disappearing because the rules are rigged by those at the top. All right, Sean, I want you to respond to that. Well, I think that, look, he's not even the president yet, and he's already being able to have some impact on what's happening with the economy and with jobs. I mean, that says a lot. I mean, he's actually getting in and doing what he can on the, what he actually can do. He can't do anything about regulation right now because he's not in office. He doesn't have his team in place. So I think we ought to have this conversation sometime in April or May after he's had a chance to come in because I think what you're going to find is you're going to find that there's going to be a lot of policies that come into play that re reduce the regulatory burden on business and we're going to have higher employment and we're going to have jobs coming back to the United States. All right, Ben, I'm going to give you the last word on this. Sure. I mean, he's putting his team in place right now and he's putting in place people who've profited massively off of home foreclosures, off of plant closures and layoffs. I mean, this is a team of billionaires that know exactly how to represent their interests. 
So what I'm worried about is that we're going to see a lot of policies that represent those at the very, very top at the expense of everybody else. We, we see the Trump universification of the federal government. Now, I hope that's not what happens. And I hope that when we talk in May, we'll both agree that he's actually delivered for, for working people in America. But frankly, who he's appointing right now really suggests that he wants those who have their thumb in a big way on the balance scale against the interests of regular people. All right. Uh, Keep ben in mind and that, Sean, that thank Obama's you so much. Geithner was coming, came right, Obama's Geithner, Treasury Secretary, came right out of the TARP. Uh, well, and, and so, there, there are you know, some, some people in President Obama's cabinet that are also quite wealthy, the Pritzker family. Yeah, look, I am all for cleaning, you know, cleaning house, bringing in people who've been fighting for working families all their lives. I'd love to see that from a Trump administration with their next cabinet appointments. Uh, we'll, we'll wait and see. All right. Well, I hope to have you both back. Ben, Sean, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Well, the mainstream media eh, was in mass hysterics last night after President-elect Donald Trump accepted a congratulatory phone call from the president of Taiwan. The left now claiming that Mr. Trump has upset decades of dis the diplomacy. So was he in the wrong for answering the phone or just another overreaction by the media? The former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, John Bolton, met with Mr. Trump just yesterday, and he joins us on the couch now. So first, off the top, we've got to ask how the meeting went yesterday, sir. Well, it was a very serious meeting, and I've just said all I'm going to say about it. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually think that, uh, you know, a president-elect ought to be able to talk to people in confidence. I think it's related to the doctrine of executive privilege, which is very important in uh, presidential uh, decision-making. And, uh, you know, uh, it, if, if they want to reveal what happened, I think it's up to them. It's not up to me. But if asked, you would take that position? Well, I would take that position. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I think you can admit that. A the little. apple cart, though, seemed like it was upended last night. Uh, if you read all the headlines that were coming out, that Donald Trump accepting this phone call from the president of Taiwan, congratulating him on becoming president, could upset decades of diplom uh, diplomacy between the United States and China. What do you make of that phone call? Should he have accepted it? Well, it's ridiculous to think that the phone call upsets decades of anything. But I do think it's important that uh, people understand the president of the United States should talk to whomever he wants if he thinks it's in the interest of the United States. Mm -hmm. And nobody in Beijing gets to dictate who we talk to. My view has been for some time that we should be upgrading our relations with Taiwan. And I know that's going to cause heartburn in Beijing, uh, but it's a reality. Uh, this is a, a nation of over 20 million people. They have a democratic government, a free press, a free market. They meet all the customary international law definitions of statehood. Uh, so when a democratically elected leader calls the president of the United States, I say, you bet he takes the call. Absolutely. Why then? Why the hysteria then? Why the mainstream media and the left saying, what, you know, he's, he's shaking up an entire relationship. They react that way reflexively with him. Yeah. Honestly, I think we should shake this relationship up. Uh, for the past several years, China has made aggressive, I would say, near belligerent claims in the South China Sea. They've declared it to be a Chinese province. They've established a provincial capital. And what that means is they're taking a vast amount of uh, water out of being international waters or waters where there's a right of innocent passage and making it into Chinese territorial waters. They're trying to put their hands around the throats of the economies of Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and others. It has a direct impact on the United States. States. They also think Taiwan's a province. So you want to talk about provinces, China? We'll talk. Yeah, and why this is so sensitive, though, is because China is our number one trading partner in the world. So on that point, where do you stand on the TPP? Because obviously that's a big one for Mr. Trump. Is it such a bad thing to, to increase trade with, with our Asia partners? Well, he said that he's going to pull the plug on TPP mm -hmm. at the beginning. I have to say, not having been involved in it at all, even back in the Bush administration, the advantage of TPP as it was sold at the beginning was strategic, that this was an alternative to increasing Chinese influence in the region. And yet TPP, as I read it, as negotiated, is just another managed trade agreement. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump said repeatedly during the campaign he believed in free trade. The problem with a lot of these agreements that have been the subject of this criticism, is, well, number one, they're not free trade. And number two, it is accurate to say that many other countries violate the commitments they make under yeah. these treaties, and we don't do anything about it. I think it's important in the Pacific we do have a strategic alternative to China. I think we can provide that. I think Donald Trump has made that clear in the campaign, too. So I think there, there's a lot that we can be doing. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Bolton, great to see you this morning, as always. Glad to be Good here. Good luck, indeed. So thanks much. for being here. Yeah, thanks Appreciate for being here.